Okay, welcome to the show, Greeley. Welcome back, mate. It's good hey. to see you again. It's fucking good to be back. Yes. That's Where good the back. fuck are you now? <laughs> I'm in Newcastle. Okay, <laughs> so you're probably the most nomadic person I've ever met in my life. So normally, like, human civilization nomad was like our default we moved around but then you know we like worked out society and 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 you were just like nah fuck that i'm gonna <laughs> live everywhere yeah well i've worked it out i've only been home one night since our last podcast <laughs> really <laughs> one night but it's been it's been it's been almost a year since then it's been eight months Fuck, that's no. crazy. I mean, that's that, if if I lived in Tassie, I probably only spend one day. A year. Is that well, is that the guess, reason? Do you think? Well, I think it's no. It's a lot of circumstance, I guess. But mm. um, you know, I guess you know, I spent most of last year not being able to get around, and yeah. So um, after we caught up, I just decided to, you know, mission around the country. It's a bit of a story, but um. Yeah, and here I am in Newcastle. Well, can you, with with the COVID restrictions, you can't even go home if you wanted to. Is that right? Uh, I can now, but I have to quarantine at the residence for two weeks. Um, there was a couple times where my flights were cancelled. I tried to get back in July, yeah. and they just cancelled my flights. And I could have still, like, pushed and got back, but at the time, <clears throat> it was easier. <clears throat> and it made more sense for me to stay up here and keep doing what i'm doing up here yeah well I, I will mention right at the top you've got a you've got a new music project coming out do you want to tell people about that yeah so um it's a project that i'm featured on uh the artist that's releasing it is denny and mm -hmm. i'm featured on three tracks so the first single drops on august 28th which is this friday but i think by the time this comes out it will be the friday just gone yep. so um the first single runaways it's called um yeah it's featured there and I guess that song's got a lot to do with um, running away and, yeah. you know, the, my journey over the last six months. Uh, well, after we caught up and I, you know, spent the few months after that recording and getting my album done that I just released in the 1st of July. And that's Risden Wisdom. And that's your, yeah. about, kind of about your time in prison. Is that yeah. fair to say? Well, well, we were talking about it in the last podcast and yeah. yeah, so I wrote it while I was inside and it was all about my experience and journey and um, I guess the lessons that I learned and I wanted to portray to the world. And um, But this new project that I'm featured on represents a, a bit of my journey this year rather than, yeah. um, it's got nothing to do with prison or any of that shit that I went through last year. It's about this year. Well, yeah, I, and it was it was good to like talking to you about that stuff in, in the sense where like you've, you've done time, but you don't want it to define you. You know, yeah. you don't want to just constantly be talking about it and be, be that guy that went to prison. So it's cool seeing you use the experience, but then also like move on from it and yeah. just move on to some other shit. Cause you know, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a big trap with the system is people get defined by it. 100%. And then it just becomes their life. Yeah, it becomes normalised to them, you know, and um, yeah, and I didn't want to do that, and that's not me, you know, like, I've had a fair bit of, <clears throat> a little bit of feedback, and I think it's through people that aren't listening to what I'm saying exactly, and they just think, oh, you're rapping about jail, and it's it's not really what, I've, what I'm doing, and there's plenty of other people doing that, and that's not what I'm trying to do, it was, um, yeah, more, <clears throat> you know, like, I didn't really want to go to jail, and but when I knew that I was, I was like, well, I'm going to flip it into something. And also being an artist and a rapper, I take my experience it and I portray it back into my art, you know? So. Well, and ultimately that is what you should be doing. Like yeah. that's what, that's what it should be for. Like the, the, the system should be, you go in and then you move on from it and you become a completely different person like some people I remember even criticized me for having you on the podcast. Like, Oh, why would you have a criminal on the podcast? He's don't you know he's been to prison. It's like, what, what would you rather happen after someone goes to prison? Like they do their time, they get out and then we still reject them from society. Like where yeah. the fuck do you think that's <clears throat> going to send that person? If you can't let people do time, get rehabilitated and, and move forward onto other shit, 
It's mm. like they're just going to get stuck back in that that situation that made them end up in prison in the first place. It's like, yeah, a real yeah. toxic way of looking at rehabilitating people and and just completely like disregards people's ability to change. It's like uh, it's like a, an even more severe version of cancel culture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like in some ways. Well, yeah, it's 100% cancel culture and it's just cancelling people's lives. And, mm. you know, it is a bit of a grey area because there are some people that are fucking bad people and they shouldn't be in society, you know. And um, mm. so it's it's a grey area because, you know, the term criminal can get thrown around a lot and, you know, there's people that um, have been spent time in jail for trying to defend trees, you know what I mean? Like... Mm. someone saying, hey, don't cut down a tree, you know, like how's that really a bad thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Try and stop. Yeah. It, it, like whatever, you know, but there's, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty gray area. And I think until people have someone they care about go through the system or anything like that, and let, or they go th- through the system themselves, it's hard to really gauge what your moral standing is is on the idea of prison because it be- it can become such a blanket term, you know, they've been to prison, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's just- yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's what, that's really what I went through. Like having someone close to me go through it. I was like, it completely changed my idea of the type of person that goes in, what the system does. And, and, and you're so right in the sense that if I didn't, and, and, you know, you're just my friend who went through it. You weren't like a family member or a parent yeah. or a child, you know, uh, and that completely changed my worldview of it. So I, I get people going, hearing the word prison and going, oh, stay away from that scary because it's just not part of people's lives and people fear what they've never seen, I suppose. But yeah, that, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And we get, you know, in society, we get fed, this is the bad place where all the bad people go bad things you know and so when you hear that word you go bad ah Mm. don't bring bad into my world i like everything good you know like (laughs) it's just um but yeah it's and and it's been interesting trying to walk that line and i've had person like people i've known for like 20 years hit me up and say i just don't you think you've got the credibility that you used to have and, and all these other things and i was like oh really is that what your perception is telling you you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, but that's just because they have the stigma in their head and they think, well, because Greeley's been to prison, he's less credible or whatever. You know what I but mean? W- like, when the, f- I would, I wouldn't say that you're a credible source of much either. <laughs> like you're a fucking rapper. Who's looking at Greeley for the news? <laughs> exactly. Like if people, people say that to me. It's like, bro, I never said I was credible. I, <laughs> I say fucking a hundred dumb things every single day on this fucking show you're looking at me for the news you are misinformed because so am i yeah (laughs) yeah i guess it depends what people are looking for i guess yeah it's a funny one Um, but i I don't want to i don't want to spend the whole thing on prison because we've done that but i i did we we did talk about this beforehand apparently a few people that you were in with who have gotten out or gone back in uh have heard like because one of the clips that we one of the clips from the podcast we did about like a prison riot and a prison fight went crazy viral on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram and that. Uh, yeah. And so a few of the other inmates have heard about that. So I'll, we'll talk about that and then we'll just move on from it. Cause you've got other shit going. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people uh, like my mate Tomo, he um, put up a little snippet. He was the fellow that threw the rock, um, the Olympic yeah. arm. I don't know if you remember that one, but yeah, he thoroughly enjoyed it. And, um, the guy from that story about the fight, uh, Woodsy, um, yeah. I, I don't think he's out, but someone else hit me up and said they showed him over the prison phone and he was stoked. <laughs> it made That's his great. Day. Yeah, so shout outs, Woodsy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm mainly happy for my own safety that he appreciated that. So that's really good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of people enjoyed it. It's interesting. Mm. Um, it's interesting the perspective now, kind of like being out for a while and and seeing people get out. And some people, you know, have done really well and like turned their shit around. And other fellas, not so much. But it's definitely, I know, the whole journey has been an interesting one, and it's still learning. Now, if you know what I mean. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, what what are you doing at the moment? You've you're currently sitting in Newcastle with a shattered ankle. Is that right? 
Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so much for freedom, huh? Yeah, yeah. But this is still, you know, I've got the internet, man. So <laughs> yeah, true. You know, no that, porn that, in prison. Exactly. Uh, um, so since we last caught up, um, I caught up with you in Melbourne. Yeah. I went. I went to Adelaide for a week to my cousin's bucks party, and we went up into the hills, and we got absolutely fucked up for like three days straight it was great yeah. we played paintball and all sorts of outrageous shit <laughs> paintball all <laughs> fucked up it sounds like an experience it was an experience and my cousins are hilarious it was it was a really good time and hang on is this like uh this knowing you this is definitely not paintball at like a paintball center this is definitely uh, just like uh, backyard situation yeah it was full bush paintball yeah and, um, no no <laughs> armor no helmet oh no the, there was armor but one of my cousins is a bodybuilder and he's so big that none of the armor would fit him. And so he just copped <laughs> and it. And he's an easy target. Yeah, he's huge. So he copped it. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, so that was that was a lot of fun. And then I went back to Tassie for, um, I think it was three nights and I only spent one of them at home. Mm. I did an album launch with Dundee. Oh, no, hold on. I got back to Tassie and then I went to Perth. So I went to Perth for a week. Yeah, and I did three shows, and then I recorded my album with Cortex. How long did you record the album for? How long did that take you? Three days. That's crazy. How many tracks was that? Twelve. Fuck, that's nuts. The most yeah. I'd ever done in a day was three, and then yeah. I was fucked. Yeah, it does take it out of you a bit. But like, like when I got back to Tassie, I was recording it a bit. And it just wasn't happening. And I knew if I went to Perth and I stayed with Cortex, he's a good friend and a, a rapper yeah. I've made music with for like a decade. And he works hard and we've got a very similar work ethic when it comes to recording. So I knew mm. if I went there for a week, I'd get it done because I don't have Man, a Man, there's, there's something done. about Perth that makes you get shit done. I think it's because there's nothing else to do there other than <laughs> create. Like when I had to do... I had like a like a two month, I think a two one month period where I needed to film twelve months worth of cooking without instructions video. So I flew to How To Basics place in Perth, yeah. and with Keelan. After this was like in between two tours. I've just finished mine, and then I was just about to begin the Luke and Lewis regional one. And yeah, yeah. we smashed out twelve episodes in ten days. I had, okay. uh, and that was just like two two a day for 10 days. Uh, and, and that was, I would say, 90% because there was fuck all else to do in Perth. Yeah, and also you're like working with motivated guys that are getting it done. And you, Yeah, you, being around it. That, I think that's important. Yeah. It's like it's especially when, when like with musical videos, it's so easy and it's almost normal to do it from home. You increasingly never get that like, going somewhere purely just to create like going to work you know we don't have a workspace we don't have a place that we that we go nine to five to like be productive so often it can be hard when your your creative time could be anywhere and at any moment so mm. sometimes when you force yourself to go somewhere where where that's your only option and that's what you're there to do it makes it so much more productive because everything else is gone yeah a hundred percent, man. And that's exactly what happened. Like, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew that, well, yeah, there's not too much else to do in Perth. And that's why, like, especially the hip hop scene is really good over there. There's so many guys that I've yeah. known for a long time now. They're all really hardworking when it comes to creating. And um, so, yeah, I went there and I smashed it out. And then I went back to Tassie and then... So while I was on the way to Perth to record, I ran into Denny, who is this new project that I've that I'm featured on. Yep. I ran into her at um, Melbourne Airport. Coincidentally, she was flying back to Tassie when I was flying to Perth, mm -hmm. and because I I <clears throat> did a show with her a few years ago, and I really wanted her to feature on my album and sing a chorus. So yep. it was it was crazy, like serendipitous that we ran into each other at the airport. And so I asked her to be on my album. I went to Perth, I recorded it. I came back to Tassie. I was there for like three days and I did a album launch with Dundee. And then, because the, the complete tour was still going. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my cousin that had just got married, the one that Bucks Party I went to, he lives up in Cairns, which was right. the ne next stop of the tour. So I was like, fuck it. 
<clears throat> I'm not doing anything else. So I went to Cairns and did the complete show. And then I went down to how, Brisbane. How were those shows like? Because he's like, especially at that time, he was like blowing up everywhere yeah. on socials with all of his music and stuff. He's, he was having like his, uh, like his second wave moment, which is really cool to see because I think he's one of the best in the country. So it was yeah. cool to see like him fight him get that like momentum that was taking him to to tours and album times because sometimes i mean you get momentum it's always great if something goes viral or if something goes well but sometimes because often most of the time you can't control it you can try a little bit but often mm. sometimes i've gotten momentum like at the wrong time like yeah. fucking three months before a tour i'm going crazy viral and if, if my if i had shows next week they'd all be full but yeah. sometimes it dies out and then you <clears> announce the tour but it was it seemed like for him he got it at the perfect moment where he dropped the album and then all this shit was going viral and then, then he went on tour so yeah. what, what were the shows like really good and as you said like completes one of the best and he deserves the best you know what i mean like yeah. he's he's such a good rapper and I think now the whole country is realizing how good he is on a on a yeah. mainstream level. He's got a few songs that really did big numbers, and all the shows we went to was really good turnout. Um, I, I did, <clears throat> I did the Hobart, Bunbury in WA, mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> Cairns, Brisbane, and Byron Bay, and they were yeah. all great, like good turnouts. Um, yeah, he's got an awesome fan base as well. And so I went to Cairns and we did that show. I did the Brisbane one. And this is as COVID was starting to pick up. Like it was yeah. all over the news. Yeah, you were doing, you were like performing when I was going, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do the festival. Yeah. It was like at the same time. Yeah, I remember even like we were in Cairns when it was kicking off and we're at some back, it's called Gilligan's. It's like a big backpacker um, yeah. place and it's got pools in the beer garden and everyone's just running around getting loose and I'm just like, fuck, this place is like, you know, it's it, when COVID hits, it's going to be fucked. And, yeah. and as well, we're shaking hundreds of hands every night and all doing that sort of stuff. So it was pretty yeah, bad. I, I was telling you, don't do meet and greets. Don't meet and <laughs> greets. But, you know, I was getting amongst it. I was like, fuck it. Why not? You know, who cares? We'll I see. mean, that's, that's the thing. If you're doing shows, you can't, you can't risk the audience, but, Ailey, like isolate yourself. It seems a little bit fucked to do that. You either do it or you don't. Yeah, hundred percent. But um, yeah, now I got amongst it, and then we did the Brisbane show. I did the Brisbane and the Byron show with Rates. Um, yeah, Curses Bra. He came through, and caught up, and it was sick doing. Man, the Brisbane set. <clears throat> Rates and I, like, we're good friends and known each other for years, and you know, we it's the first time we caught up properly, and we didn't rehearse at all. And we just caught up at a hotel and we, yeah. you know, got a little stoned and just fucking, we're like, nah, we'll be right. We'll have a good raz, you know? And um, yeah. so the set that we did not, that night, we ended up doing like 10 minutes stand up in between each of the songs. That's sick. It was really, it was really good. Like, cause right and I, like good friends, we've got our own like in jokes. Like whenever he's, we're either of us in a bad mood and we talk to each other, we always say, mate, do you need me to tickle your joots? <laughs> And it cheers each other up. So yeah. as, so as soon as we got up on stage in Brisbane, we're like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, who's here to get their juts tickled? And fucking, <laughs> when we say tickle, you say juts, tickle, juts, tickle. And like, just, yeah, uh, we've all been dickheads. But it was so much fun because it was like dead set, a stand-up set, as well as a hip-hop set. And well, that's we, what that's what a lot of people don't realize about about um and people know it about you because you, you've done it, but like yeah. especially Cursor and and Rates, they don't realize that they're so they're so funny. Like they're so, they're yeah. funnier than a lot of comedians that I know. Like just Definitely. talking, hanging out, banter in group chats. Like mm. they're they're ruthless. They're very funny guys. I fucking oath. Yeah, it was fucking heaps of fun. Eh? I love performing with Rates, and um. And then we did the Byron show on the Sunday mm. and then COVID laws started Monday morning. So like oh, literally we did a last show before the whole country got shut down 
Fuck, and... I'm jealous. I because I hadn't performed because I was I did the regional tour and then yeah. I was like, oh, I just did my personal tour and then a regional tour. I think I need like a few weeks off. And then I had a few weeks off and then I was like, all right, I'm ready to go back. And then they banned it. I was like, no, and I haven't gone on stage <laughs> since. Yeah, I was lucky. We got in there just before it hit. And um and yeah, so then they cancelled all my flights back to Brisbane. I mean, back to Tasmania. Yeah. And so I just stayed in Brisbane. And at that point, my album was done and recorded. And I was going to do the videos with No One Network, which are based in Brisbane. But the yeah. original plan was just to fly them down to Tassie to do them. But when I was stuck in Brisbane, and I was like, well, if I go, if I can get back to Tassie, then this shit's not happening for a long time. Yeah, and you know, I just dedicated everything to getting this album done. So I was like, "Well, fuck it, I'll stay in Brisbane and get it done." And um, I ended up in Brisbane for about three months. Yeah, and filmed all the video clips, um, released the album from Brisbane, and so during this time, I kept talking with Denny, like through collaborating, getting her on my album. Yeah, and she she started sending me her own beats to collab with her, and I was like, "Sweet." And um, so then we got a few tracks going and she wrote a few of her own. And I was like, what are you doing? Come up to Brisbane. And so she missioned from Tassie to Newcastle because her family's here in Newcastle. Yeah. And, and then she drove up to Brisbane. She got to Brisbane a week before Wisdom Wisdom dropped. Yeah. On the Wednesday. And so... She recorded her whole EP on that weekend, so the weekend before my album dropped. Mm -hmm. And so we spent, yeah, two days in the studio with Nerve, a rapper from Brisbane, the the one that Slut dropped at your um, at the Brisbane. Yeah, club. yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, shout out to Nerve. He did a great job of the EP, produced a beat on there as well. And um, he's so good as as a producer as well. I didn't yeah. for for a long time. I didn't realize <clears throat> that he he produced, but he's like. He's like done a bunch of stuff for himself and then, and then other rappers like even chilling it and then yourself. I didn't realize that because, because a lot of like a lot of rappers who make beats, they're like, I rap and I can make beats, but they're like, they're just okay. They're just good enough to rap over the top of, but nerve makes some real like good shit. Like his stuff as a producer stands alone. Like mm. if he, without his rap and without anyone putting on it, if you just listen to it blind, you'd be like, fuck this producer is awesome. Yeah, he's he's a great producer. He's really good at anything he puts his mind to. Very yeah. ta very talented and a hard working artist, you know, like I've watched him grow over the last 3 or 4 years from when I first met him and um yeah, he's he's reaching a very elite level of all of his craft. Everything Yeah, he'll be he'll he's going to be so fucking big once once 100%. uh once enough people catch on, he'll be fucking huge. Mm. Oh, I think they already are. Like and, and yeah, they get, they're getting there. Yeah. For I'm sure. pretty sure some like triple J radio hosts had a crush on him and they were just talking about him for like a good month straight. So, yes, you know, yeah. he's definitely, he's, he's making a big impact on the industry as well as the local scene. And he's still very, you know, always down to work on projects and get shit done. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's so, it's really cool and interesting seeing how the entire Australian hip hop scene has like, evolved because for a long long time in terms of people getting any shine it was like only like you and the people around you so it was only like cursor uh rates jay and then forte and then a few others from sydney and then there was you and then there was complete and the people around complete from perth and that was like from someone who who wasn't like a full oz hip-hop nerd those yeah. were like the main people, but now it's, it's like diversified and become so incredibly popular. And all of the new guys are like blowing up as well. Yeah. Like, all, like what are your thoughts on, on, on how it's changed? Because when I first got into it, when I, so you, you'd been doing it for many years when I first got interested in it in like 2012. Mm. Uh, but when I liked it, it was for people who, who weren't fans of it. It was lame and you would get made fun of and people would laugh at it and people would share it as a joke. But now I've, I've seen it like 
it's becoming cool. The entire genre is like becoming cool. And even if you don't like it, you at least go, Oh, but they're doing their own thing. Like before, if you didn't like it, you would ridicule it and hate on it. But now it's kind of entering this new, this new stage of, of acceptance uh, and, and even like mainstream popularity with like all with one four and the HP boys and hooligan hefts and all of these Islander guys that are blowing up. I never thought it would have been the Islanders that would have made like Oz hip hop cool to, yeah, to like everyone. It's interesting. Cause I mean, like there's still, like, there's a generation before me, which is, you know, Hilltop hoods and, um, and those guys like, I mean, it's interesting that one four have now got the international rep, you know, representation, I guess. And well, they just, it, they just did a fucking track with ASAP Ferg like that that to to for me to think of that happening for like because they're they're huge but they're still coming up in their own yeah. right so for an american rapper to work with uh australians that are coming up that was like so not possible even a few years ago yeah i mean like cursor had the track with future and you know that's there true. Was, i might there, be talking out my ass here no, that's all right like and it's at the end of the day we've all got perspectives you know and I've been around long enough to see a bit of perspective of what Australian hip hop was before I came along. Mm. And it was still like, I mean, yeah, Hilltop Hoods, like a lot of Australian hip hop came through and started getting serious in the late nineties. There was a, an, a compilation album called culture of Kings, which yep. had all the rappers that were getting busy from around the country on it. And that was like the first ever Oz hip hop compilation sort of thing. And yep. Hilltop Hoods were on there. And if you look at all the names on that, those CDs, it came down to who was working the hardest at pushing themselves to a high level in the music industry that have made it from that generation. You know what I mean? Mm. And like, I know like a lot of these guys are doing big numbers on the net, but Hills Up Hoods are still selling more tickets and CDs than any other artists in the country, you know? And, yes. and, so, and some people might not see you know, based on their perspective of might see that not in the same category as one four, but it's, it's definitely, it's Australian hip hop and it's evolved, you know, more and more and more. And, um, there were always like some Polynesian and Islander fellas in the scene, but they definitely, the scene, I guess, was a lot more smaller than for, and the majority was white Australians, you know, yeah. that was, and that's still like, I even feel a bit weird saying that because there's always been fellas from all different backgrounds in Australian hip hop, you know, but I guess when you look at the, the big level success sort of side of it, um, it was like Hilltop Hoods, Bliss and Esso, um, even like early days was Muffin Plutonic, all those sort of guys that kept evolving and pushing it bigger, but it was still, caught in mainstream Australian music where the audience was mainly aimed at the whole kind of the white aspect, if you know what I mean? Yeah, there, there was, there's, for me, uh, and I, I probably, this is probably just because I don't know the people beyond when I first got interested in it. Cause I was so young for me, it was like, it seemed, it seems to have gone in waves where like wave one was like Hilltop, listen, SO, and then that was like very much like radio yeah. industry, get picked, buy a really good hook, insert bars in between the chorus, and then you've got yourself a banger. Uh, that's like Illy and stuff, you know, buy a chorus, yeah. fill it. It's like, you know, coloring in basically, but rap. And then the second yeah, wave yeah. was like your gen yep. of like more street stuff, which was like just come up on your own uh, and doing like real shit like what you would have heard uh the americans kind of do like yeah. making real street stuff but <clears throat> you naturally you had to do it outside of the industry which is why i gravitated towards it so much because that's what i wanted to do with my comedy like real yeah. real shit that wasn't that was for people not for executives to yeah. put me in front of people it was just like oh, i want to do my thing and what i think is true to me and what i think is good that seems like your gen it was like the second wave to me as someone yeah. who was 18 when they got into it. And then now it seems like it's like this third wave that is, that has come because of all of the roads that were paved for the first two. Mm. Uh, now it seems like 
like young kids are just like doing one song and getting a million views. And that's from, you know, Spotify being so important and then being able to blow up on YouTube and being able to pay someone a hundred bucks to hold a camera and make an amazing film clip from from their bedroom and stuff. It seems like now it's, it's so open to anyone to kind of do, to do anything, which is good, but is also has negatives of like, you might have people that, that are doing it to capitalize on how, how seemingly easy it is rather than because they want to become it. Oh yeah. hundred percent. There was definitely a wave of people that rapped that weren't rappers, you know, mm. like even kids in America, are like I just want to sell Xanax or so write a song about it. And then it blows up on Spotify and they're a rapper, you know, yeah. like, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very good way to put it. Like I was kind of a part of the second wave and when we were coming up with, it was like you either had to fit into the, the industry box of what they were doing or you weren't allowed in. And mm. that's where Curse, <clears throat> Curse had changed the game. And, yeah. you know, he was one of the first people to get mainstream level success without industry backing. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, and he definitely changed and opened the doors for a lot of guys that are coming through now. But I think the new movement is great. I think that hip hop is, you know, for everyone. And I think it's fucking awesome to see people from different backgrounds empowering themselves through music and through creating. Um, You know, there's a lot of people that get jealous of how easy it is these days, but I think it's a positive thing. I mean, I, I think everyone should have a chance to tell their story. And in the past, let's say in the 90s, there's whole generations of different people with different backgrounds that never got to tell their story because they didn't fit into that little fucking box, you know? And yeah. And, and also, cause, cause I get that from my side of like, you know, blowing up online, people think that it's easy and it's like, it's not easy. It's just different. And, and, and also because it's the internet, essentially, I mean, you can do it too. Like nothing stops you from, doing this, the same thing, doing a film clip, putting something on Spotify and then it bangs, you know, it's like, hundred percent. It, it's just uh, different. <clears throat> I'm sure, I'm sure like, you know, what I think is easy is doing whatever you're told and ticking the right boxes. And then someone in a suit goes, all right, you're famous. Do what I say. You'll be a millionaire to me. That's, yeah. that seems pretty easy to me. <clears throat> it's like that's, that's everything has its own, er, everything has its own struggle, I suppose. Mm, and and yeah. the grass is always greener, you know. I look at mainstream guys and I go, oh, that's fucking easy. But I bet they look at me and go, oh, that guy, that's fucking easy. He just makes a video once a week. You yeah, hundred percent. It, it's, it's always it's always <clears throat> been like that of people looking at other people, not a hundred percent understanding it and going, oh, that look, I could do that if I wanted. It's like, yeah, you probably couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, straight up, man. Uh, that grass is greener thing is always the case, I think. Especially in any sides of any sort of whether it be music, comedy, or, you know, different genres of performance or mm. creation. But, yeah, I think the new age is great. Um, I think, yeah, it's interesting watching hip-hop fans argue about it, you know, but mm. I believe that, like, we all come from the same tree, if you know what I mean. I've, I heard this yeah. from an old-school hip-hop head that I met here in Newcastle, and he said, you know, hip hop is like a tree and we're all on our different branches and you don't see the branches fighting with each other. You know, we all keep growing yeah. from the tree. And so for me as a hip hop artist, I just want to give my energy back to the tree and like, you know, fuel others to do better. And well, that, that's how I've, that's how I've always viewed it. It's like, uh, especially with the, with the internet being such a, a huge thing, like, what's better for everyone is to just work with each other because uh, if, if there is no like industry anymore in terms of radio play and getting on festivals is seeming less and less important. It's yeah. like w- when, when there are no opportunities that are limited by nature, uh, if everyone works together, it essentially becomes your success is my success. Like the, if the tree gets taller, all the leaves get more sun. Exactly. Exactly. It's the best way to put it, man. It's a very good way to put it. So yeah, man, it's, you know, it's exciting. I think that, um, 
the more different styles and the more different people involved, it's just going to keep growing. And yeah, it's interesting watching watching it all evolve. Uh, but yeah. I'm all for it, you know. I, I yeah, really enjoy all aspects of it. Yeah, it is good. So, uh, so with this uh, new EP, like, what's your what's your plans with it? How are you How are you releasing it? Uh, so, um, so yeah, like Danny and I ended up in a relationship, pretty much. And oh, so, congratulations! I, thank you very much. And I'm here in Newcastle, so I came back with her after. Bro, I thought so. Oh, but I didn't want to be disrespectful. I was like, right. "Oh, you guys are making music together. Obviously, that means you're fucking." I didn't want to say that. <laughs> That's yeah. good. I'm yeah, happy for you. Thank you, bro. It's, it's a really good thing. And um, yeah, well, so after we did the EP, uh, we filmed three video clips in Brisbane with AV Club and No One Network, mm-hmm. and, and then um, we came down to Newcastle. And I'd been here for three days and I went to go suss out a grass spot and I broke my ankle. Yeah, how did you do that? I still, you told me how you did it and I still didn't understand it. Um, like I was walking down the slope and as I was walking, I slipped and I went do down the slope and at the bottom was a gutter. So as I've hit the bottom, I just like caught my ankle on it and just snapped. Like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I hate and that. It was full dangling. It was like doing these ones <laughs> off the end of my Yuck. leg. Yeah, so I've um, never I've never broken a bone. I don't think I can handle it. I reckon I pass out. I'm a you'd be pussy surprised. Like that. You'd be surprised in the moment. I thought I would have um whinged a lot more, but it was actually pretty good. I saw you you were filming videos like selfie recording yourself sucking on the green whistle and then telling stand up <laughs> jokes to the paramedics, making them laugh. I was I was the whole time, man, I was just like fucking doing bits to firemen, the Ambo drivers the staff in the hospital why was the fireman there did you fall over and light a bonfire no the, they needed to get the fireman to carry me out of the drain yeah yes oh you were in like slip. one of those big things yeah in the big drain oh yeah. fuck how did they get you out that would be hard they put me on a stretcher and about 12 of them carried me out <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah but um, <clears throat> back to the real- – yeah, so here I am in Newcastle with Danny and yeah. I've got a snapped ankle. It's been about a month and um, I've got to start rehab in a few weeks, so I've been pretty stuck here. But it's given me a lot of time to focus on pushing this new release with her. And um, yeah. so the first video clip we're dropping on Friday um, – and then the EP is going to be available in the first week of October with another single. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, just keep the ball rolling. But we're looking at doing a diff- few different things and premieres. And, um, yeah, that's the plan that's pretty good. much. Just just go hard and see how far we can push it. Fuck, yeah. What's your um- – i will be interested to hear, you've always got interesting theories. What's your thoughts on the whole COVID thing? Where do you think this is going to go? I, I think that in terms of shows, there's going to be no shows until there's a vaccine. So the latest thing that I've heard is that we've bought the, the, like the recipe for a vaccine that we must, I hope we're pretty sure works. Mm. Uh, and I think that there's not going to be any, shows until that's been out and i don't think i don't think they're going to make it mandatory because i think that that the government's pretty actually pretty conscious of coming across as evil and tyrannical i don't think that's what they want to do um i reckon they're going to put out this vaccine and they're going to go all right everything's open now the vaccine's available and if you die that's on you because you can get it sorted if you want <clears throat> um or do you think they're going to go full evil mode and it includes a microchip with a gps in it and you have to get it or, or we kill your dog yeah I, I just don't know and i to be honest like since covid has kicked in i haven't really given a fuck <laughs> <laughs> that, and um, that is the right way to look at it a guy had two family members in america die from it really yeah yeah that like my great auntie i think wow. and, I, and and these are people i don't really know that well they've you know 
distant relatives. But yeah, I, America sounds crazy. Mike Keelan, the editor, you know him. He yeah. uh, he said he talked to four friends from America, and three of them would had it. Yeah, which is like just uh, it's obviously it's anecdotal, but it's still crazy. Do you, now, yeah. what do you think about the conspiracy theory of people uh, actually not having it? They just get marked as having it, and that's why they die. Do you think that holds? Uh, I. I like if I if I just start forming opinions about this, then all of a sudden I'm going to be fucking going crazy, putting up statuses, <laughs> and like, and the yeah. world's pretty corrupt, the world's yeah. pretty fucked. It's um you know I don't trust the system, I don't trust the government, um, and it's interesting because I know down in Victoria it's hectic at the moment, and everyone's like in lockdown craziness. But like in mm. WA, like draft and complete are doing a tour at the moment. I am so jealous. I see comedians and like Rory Lowe. He just booked an 800 seat theater in Perth. I, I'm like, fuck, I'm so jealous. Yeah. It's, um, so it's interesting. I, I think it comes down to where you're at in regards to how it affects you. But I, I don't know. Like there's a lot of conspiracies going around. And I used to be a conspiracy nut. I've even had people, I've had th my conspiracy fans hit me up like, why aren't you doing this and talking about this and that? And it's like, no, oh, I just, I can't feed into it. I can't allow mm. myself to be brought into that negative realm. Like, Well, it, it, there, there is a lot to be said to that in, in the sense that uh, it just sends you nuts, a lot of that stuff. Exactly. Like, and that's the, like... And that's mind control at its best. You know what I mean? Like if they're already fucking with your head to the point where you're panicking and nothing's happening to you in front of you, mm. then they're already winning, you know, in my opinion. That's good. I like that. A like, conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories in itself. That's great. This is, yeah. this is like upper, upper tier shit. Like, oh, yeah. you think conspiracy theories are real? What are you, a fucking sheep? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I guess I've hit the next level, you know, yeah. like... You've it's, graduated. Um, yeah, I've graduated, like... Yeah, and that's what disinformation is, you know, and a lot of, you know... Well, that, that shit, we know that shit is real, like the... Exactly. Like, you know, uh, foreign governments are doing that to to their enemies, like if they can't go to war with guns, you can do it with information. Like if you, if you can, the only thing better than like defeating a nation yourself is making a nation crumble and fight themselves, you know, like yeah. Russia, we know Russia's trying to do that to America and yeah. you know, for sure, America's trying to do that to Russia. Yeah. Like it's just this big back and forth of like your government's fucked. No, your government's fucked. And then both of the government's waiting for the other one to re revolt. A hundred percent. And you know, there's, there's certain, there's people I, I've looked up to as, as rappers and artists. And sometimes like it's one in particular, he said, I'm never going to fucking rap about politics because it gives them, it validates them. You know what I mean? It gives them a plat, like even rapping about them makes them legitimate in his world. And mm. he, this, this guy lives by his own sort of rules. And, and I think that's what everyone should do. And I understand, like I see videos of cops taking, trying to take kids off people in the city and all sorts of shit. And everyone's sharing, well, what if they take your kid off you daycare? Cause it's got sniffles and, and that's a fucking real thing to be scared of. Like, but I don't have all the answers and my best answer for you is to go Bush because <laughs> yeah. the guys I mean, are, yeah. they, I, like, I, there's like, there's a guy in Tassie called hairy man who didn't like the government fucking 30 years ago. And so he lives in the bush and you don't, <laughs> he doesn't have a fucking name. He's yeah. a hairy man. And he's hairy. Like, yeah. And once every now and then he'll come out into the real world and he'll go to a pub and stand in a pub and sing a song. And then he goes back and you don't see him again for another year. And yeah. that's that, like, if you're freaking out and you think, fuck, the government's going to take my rights to be free, just do the hairy man and go bush. Because I mean, yeah, if you, if you really think that the people in charge are evil, it's, you might want to, you know, stick with that. And it's like, yeah. if you can't, it's either that or you, 
fucking cause a violent revolution as well. Yeah, you, could, uh, do, you could do that. You know, there's lots of. Although I don't think anyone's following Hairy Man into battle. You know, like you'd be surprised. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a hard one, man. And you know, like for me, I'm I'm kind of isolated at the moment just because of my circumstances. Yeah. But um, uh, I just wish people would chill out a bit. It is funny. I I it put it. I would remember talking to you a few, might have been like a month or so ago when victoria went into lockdown like proper lockdown lockdown mm. and i was talking to you complaining about it i was like oh man it's fucked i feel like i'm in prison and you just went do you <laughs> <laughs> and i went oh yeah i guess it's all right i guess it, i'll be fine and that's the thing like it's at least it's not that you know yeah um and yeah i like the internet you know there's so many other things that we can do you know prison's a bit shit <laughs> well, that's that's the thing, you know. I, I think that whatever, let them take over our lives. Let let them uh, lock us all up because at the end of the day, we all know what's going to happen. We're going to invent a new virtual reality and we'll live in there. So yeah, that's, that, that's what's coming at the end of the day, a brand new reality. Let's look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll always find a way around whatever, I guess. I think so. But, yeah, for me personally, man, I, I just, I don't know what's going to come. I just know that if I can make the most of every situation I'm in, that's all that counts, you know? And I think I, so. I've had some fucking curveballs thrown at me over the last couple of years and every single one of them I've managed to turn into something positive. You know, that album, I managed to hit the number one spot for like three days on the hip hop charts and that Let's enough see. for me was like, I can take fucking a shit experience and put it into this object that has carried me to a fucking very positive place, you know? And, um, yeah. and yeah, I think everyone should do that. You know, like, let's say you, you're locked down and you're stuck in your house for six weeks. Why don't you spend that six weeks, you know, researching something that you're going to, that's going to make you a millionaire, you know, like, yeah, I, actually like I've, I've watched like, um, I know a couple of e-commerce guys that their whole thing is they just build like online websites and sell shit. And I've, literally watched this one guy become a millionaire. He's like 20 something. Yep. And I just like through his Instagram stories of him going, Oh, well, I don't have anything else to do. And I literally watched the guy in real time, make a million dollars. And I was like, fuck, that's, that's crazy. What am I doing making videos for? <laughs> yeah. But, it, but it is, it is true. Like, you know, I, that's what I've used the time for. Like I've, I've capitalized on the, the shit situation that it is by, going hard with videos and podcasts and ev everything's growing. And I, and I know that as, as, as awful as it is not being able to do what I love, I know that because the online thing's been going so well and I've been putting out so much stuff and, and giving and giving and giving to the people who like my stuff, I know that whenever I can do shows, whether it's next month or six months from now, uh, when I do go, all right, guys, let's fucking rally around each other and let's have a fucking sick night. I know that everyone's going to come out. So yeah, I and, think you it'll know, be worth and it. it. And I mean, like for the conspiracy heads that do think that they're trying to take all of our freedom, why would they still be doing tourism WA? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I feel that people are just reacting to their own, circumstances i know a few guys in melbourne that are just like they're fucking coming to take our shit and just you know wigging out and it's like oh so what they're just gonna start with melbourne you know what i mean like it is it, it is strange where like i think that say that it, say that there is this illuminati government i don't think they want us to be at home i think they want us to be slaving away making money for them you 100%. know like if ultimately if we're not making money, neither are they. I think they want us yeah. to be out there working. They want us to be China. If if that's the if that's the evil government, that's the end goal of China. Yeah, yeah, like straight people up. literally working themselves to death, like dying at their office desk because they've spent eighteen hours there for you know sixty years or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's what they want. They don't want us at home doing nothing, making no money for them. Yeah, it, <laughs> make, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I think like yeah when everything does get to chill out again and we can do events and different stuff. I know down in Tassie, like I've seen a few crew down there putting on bush doofs 
and they're getting 400 yeah, yeah. people out in the bush together and having good times. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's, um, yeah, I'm just going to look forward to when, when that day comes and just keep creating in the, in the meantime, you know? Fuck yeah. Well, I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up in a minute, but I have uh, uh, just one email that, I, that I'd like to read with you. Let's uh, go. From a listener. Uh, so if you'd like to email the show, podcast at loosebeers.com, you've got a good story, you need some life advice, whatever, all right? So we have this email, uh, a little bit of high art I think you'd enjoy. Uh, the subject line is breaking a toilet with a nearly month-old shit. A month-old shit? <laughs> this is good. All right, um, I'm strapping myself in. Great. Uh, hey, Lewis, be listening to the podcast. Love your stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, my name is Sam. The story takes place a few years ago on one of my family visits to India. Oh, this is good. This is like a second world poo. I like this. Uh, I live in Dubai um, and only come to India for a few months every year, so I'm not used to living there. A little backstory about my family. We're pretty famous in our city and we are members of the city's country club, which costs $400 a month for membership. And because it was an expensive club, it had many luxuries, including a proper toilet. Isn't that like how first world are we where a toilet in India is a luxury, mm. um, which is better than the normal Indian toilet, which is just a hole in the ground. Uh, mm. So I decided the next time I went to the club, I would shit there. Uh, and so I went four weeks without shitting. Four what weeks. The fuck? Four weeks without shitting. Surely not. How did you do that without dying? Yeah, that's that's like four weeks without shitting. Like, how much do you eat? This you must like, have been eating much. I mean, I guess he was. Maybe they didn't have very much food there. <laughs> I don't know the situation. Um, all right, I, I'm, I'm. Yeah, four weeks. I need like. Did you take a photo of this final shit? There's no photo uh, attached, but if you have one, uh, mate, send it through. I would love to it see through. it. Um, <laughs> that's, I'm going to regret saying that. Uh, <laughs> so I go four weeks without shitting and I barely avoid pooing my pants. I arrive at the club and I have a meal with my family. Bro, I would have skipped that meal. If I went four weeks without a shit, the first thing I'm doing is going straight to the bathroom. Yeah, as if you could have, like... You You'd have one mouthful and then just be fucking turtle heading straight away. It's like one <laughs> one bit would enter your body and yeah. like, did you not eat for the four weeks, bro? Uh, this is the hardest bit I'm finding wrapping my head around. Yeah, that 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 he's skipped over, which is strange. So uh, I have a meal uh, and um, with my family. After which I tell them I need to use the restroom and they can do whatever they want. I go into the first stall and start to shit. I won't go into full detail, but it was the worst poo I've ever had in my life. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Midway through, I flush it. Midway! Bro, that's a monster. If you're flushing midway, that's like a war crime you're doing in there. <laughs> but I've, I don't think I've ever done that. I've never flushed midway. I want to know, like, in what ways was it the worst shit? You should have gone into detail, man. Like, you know... Mm. It, was it solidified? Was it just like passing a fucking kidney stone out your ass? Like, was it? I, I would think that it, be, because he's not native, he doesn't like live in India all the time. I'm I'm feeling a very liquid situation. Yeah, well, like, but how did it break the toilet if it was liquid? You That's know, true. I mean, and also, well, if you were doing liquid poos, you're not going to last four weeks. So it must nah, it must be a giant log. It, it must be just like a fucking. <laughs> A fucking a clogger, you know what I mean? One that like <laughs> it's got to be like a, a firm fist of shit that's yeah. stopping, you know what I mean? Like it's got to be a hairy man poo for sure. A hairy man poo. Once when I was in prison, this guy did a, the biggest shit I've ever seen, <laughs> and he came up to my cell and he was like, "Did you shit in the toilet?" And I went out and had a look at it, and it looked like a fucking water feature inside. <laughs> inside the toilet bowl and the, when you'd flush it and the water would just splash around it. Like oh a, no. Like a fountain. And <laughs> fucking, it was, a, it was, a, it looked like, uh, do you remember the movie Dogma? No. It had, um, Jay and Silent Bob in it and they had to like fight a shit monster. <laughs> no, it I've was, never seen that. 
Oh, you should watch it. It looks like this shit monster. And that yeah, still but... didn't break the toilet. You know what I mean? It... What did you do with it? Because there's, there's no plumber in prison. What happened? I think it stayed there for a couple of hours until someone decided to somehow chop it up <laughs> and flush it down. Oh, no. Yeah, because that's, that's an interesting thing. If there is like a, a, a shit, like that's just a prisoner's problem. You can't call, yeah. like there's no maid, is there? No, there's not. You just got to deal with it. The other trick is if the toilet gets blocked, you put your hand in a garbage bag and just fucking straight in and pull out the blockage. Oh, yuck. And you just have to cop it sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. That's hectic. A water feature. You know, my yeah. favourite my favorite thing that you ever told me about prison was that because everyone has the same diet, all farts smell the same. Yeah. That's fucking beautiful you'd never know who farted did you fart like mate honestly i could have (laughs) i've got no idea just comes down Um, to when (laughs) but yeah so the work it was the worst shit ever yeah uh midway through i flush it and as it's flushing it stops oh so he clogged halfway that's the worst type of clog so i thought i would have to flush more to get it to go down and as i keep flushing it stops and the shit water starts to rise ah that's how he broke it quickly i realized i had broken one of the best toilets in the city as the water started to overflow, I closed the lid and quickly moved two stalls over because I still had half a shit left. <laughs> Good effort. That's great. Then it becomes like a Mission Impossible theme thing, like where, you know, he's clogged one toilet and now he has to finish the poo before his feet get wet. <laughs> That's great. He's on like level two. Um uh, I moved two stalls over because I still had half a shit left to do. And once I finished, I checked if anyone else was there before leaving because I was really embarrassed and didn't want to be spotted. As I was leaving, I see the cleaner quickly walking in from the other entrance and I ran away in shame. I can only imagine the horror on his face when he finds one of the toilets overflowing with a shit clogging the tubes. As I left, I'd learned that I was in fact in the restroom for 40 minutes and hid the fact that I'd broken one of the toilets. I was scared they were going to figure out it was me and charge me for the repairs. That's the end of my story. Have a shit one, Sam. (laughs) Oh, he should have just done the garbage bag trick. That would have sorted his problem out real quick. I know, but that would have been even more sus. Like, imagine going to the fanciest restaurant in India, doing a poo for 40 minutes and then coming out going, excuse me, uh, I need a garbage bag. You got wet feet, (laughs) smell like shit. (laughs) I I think that he's really gotten away with it there. That's great. Yeah, you've done well, man. You've done well. I'm guessing, yeah, like, because it blocked the toilet. It must have been a fucking solidified one. And, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, garbage tr- bag trick would have sorted your problems, bro. But um, mm. He also it, ended the email with, I also have another poo-related story if you'd like to hear it. Um, dude, I think that you need to see a doctor. Yeah, I think you just need to take a shit once a day, man. Like, Yeah, I'd say that's your issue, bro. If you have, if you have two stories like that, there's something wrong. Yeah. Four weeks without a shit. What's <laughs> like four weeks without a shit? I don't think that's possible. I remember. I, I remember. I need to it, Google it. Yeah, Google it. I remember fucking. There was a movie I watched years and years ago, and some guy on there couldn't fucking take a shit for a long time. I don't know what to like Google here. Thing. Longest time without pooing. Oh, how long can you go without pooing? Yeah, Google. there we go. Here we go. Maybe we're just wrong, and you can go three months. A normal poo frequency is anywhere from three times a day to every other day. Every other day. I don't think I do that. What's every other day? Like every second day. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. Uh, Doctors define constipation as pooing two, two or fewer times a week. So if you do none for four weeks, that's scientifically impossible, they think. Here we go. Oh, great. (laughs) <laughs> one extreme example is a young woman from the United Kingdom who died after eight weeks of not going to the restroom. The stool caused her intestines to enlarge so significantly they pressed on her organs and led to a heart attack. Damn. 
that's nuts. Who doesn't shit for eight weeks and is like, oh, like how do you get to week three and not see a doctor? Yeah, that's um, no, just yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, this, at that point, I feel like the stool would be so big you could use it as a stool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. think, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up there guys before we get too fucking graphic here hey man thanks thanks for coming on the show hey thanks for having me and um much love bro yeah no fucking worries tell people what they sure. where can they find your stuff what's coming up um so yeah the single runaways is on my youtube channel really thc um pretty ironic well, name for a man who can't run at the moment yeah i know yeah it's um <laughs> Irony is coincidentally a part of my music very much. <laughs> but, yeah, if you can follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. I'll keep everything updated there. And, um, yeah, if, right. you haven't, if you haven't checked my album since the last podcast, uh, Rizd and Wisdom is available on Spotify, uh, iTunes, Apple Music, all that shit. Um, really, really great album. The Cycle is yeah. my favourite off that, I, if you want to play today, one song. I yep. found out today that... Um, the prison is now allowing copies of my album to be brought into the prison for other inmates. Amazing. Which is great. I'm fucking That's stoked. really good. Yeah, I found out one of my good mates got a copy today. And, or, you know, I found out that he got the copy today. So, Man, that's, uh, that's so fucking cool. I think that's and, great. And this was the guys that I was sitting in there, you know, as I was writing it and showing them the lyrics and telling them my plan of, like, how I'm going to get out and do it and do all the videos and, you know, I want to get the number one spot. And So everything that I manifested while I was away has come true. And now it's, like, it's great that I've put this experience into this album that I'm showing those guys that I originally, because that's my plan is I'm, I'm just trying to like inspire people. And well, dude, that there, I am, I'd imagine that there, that would be incredibly inspiring for these people that were, you know, a part of the writing process and the creation process and the inspiration behind it, yeah. you know, like seeing them, seeing you create it and yeah, then it, getting fucking hard copies in the gates allowed by the prison. Yeah, which is, like, I didn't expect. Like, the, the album's got a picture of the prison on the front cover. You know, I used the newspaper article where they said, rapper goes to jail for his hip-hop hit, and I used yeah. that for the back. I, I've used, you know, like, I take the piss out of some of the screws. did you it. call one of the screws a cunt in the album? Yeah, in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> and now that's a big win, isn't it? Uh, that's a fucking win. I'm like, yes, I'm fucking, yeah, I'm stoked, you know. And at the end of the day, like, I put it on the inside of the cover of, of my album and it says, you know, to anyone listening, I hope I can show you how to take a shit situation and flip it on its head and I wish you all the best, you know, because... Awesome. Um, yeah, because, you know, there's a lot of people that I, I care about that I want to be able to flip their situation on its head and better themselves, you know, because no one likes to see someone you care about doing shit. Amazing. All right. Mm. Well, we'll end it there. Make sure you check out Greeley's album and the EP coming up. I'll leave all the links in the description of this. Uh, and thanks for coming on, man. Really, really good. Thanks, bro. There's some fucking freestyle gang signs for you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Have a shit one, guys. See you later. See ya.